Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and I'm looking forward once again to spending as much time with you as you can make available today because I've got a great show. Joe Dallas is going to join me in just a minute. And then my friend and Bible teacher, Jeff Verdorn, will be in hour two as we're going to start a study on the book of Timothy. So I'm looking forward to both hours, and I hope you are too. Thanks for uh, spending time with me. Uh, My guest, Joe Dallas, is... You'll find him speaking at conferences, at book signing tables. You'll find him in the counseling office, but you will find him happiest when he's at home with his family. He is an author and a speaker and deals with sexual and relational problems. He's got a biblical counseling ministry, and I learn a lot from him, and you will learn a lot from him as well. Joe, welcome back. Nice to have you. Hey, good talking with you again, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I've got, we've added another station in Billings, Montana. So Faith Radio is really kind of on the move. So I'm introducing you to a whole new audience in Billings today. And so I'm, I'm always glad that that, well, that, God, hey. that God is moving in such miraculous ways. And that's uh, terrific. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's nice to uh, it's nice to see what God's doing in the life of Faith Radio and in your ministry. And because I want to ask some questions that I think are relevant to a lot of people, it's on their minds. Um, let's just jump in. I, I would assume that in, I don't need to have any preface in advance of this conversation for smaller ears. I I don't know if I need any warning, do I? No, I really don't feel you will, no. I mean, we're talking about serious uh, topics, but none that are inappropriate for kids. Absolutely. So thank you. All right. Now, Joe, one of the things that has popped up is th- this idea about a person and their orientation. When did that language surface? How long has that been around? Because I don't think sexual orientation was anything that was around in biblical times? Uh, No, Bill, it wasn't. I I think that uh, orientation as a concept really caught on around the 1970s. Okay. The homosexuality, which is really what gave rise to the orientation issue, uh, homosexuality was widely regarded up until then as a behavior and as a disordered desire. But uh, around the time that the American Psychiatric Association reclassified homosexuality from a disorder to uh, neutral status, that's when the concept of orientation really caught on, because orientation implies that uh, that's the way you were created, that's the way you are, it's immutable, it's natural to you. And that makes it all a lot more acceptable, you see? So uh, I know when I was a gay activist uh, back in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, we pushed hard for the idea of people um, understanding orientation because that was a way of saying, look, this is who we are. Mm -hmm. And because this is who we are, this is our orientation. It's wrong to say that our very being is somehow wrong. Now, I do want to be quick to say, Bill, there is such a thing as homosexual desire. And for people who have homosexual desires, those desires are pretty deeply ingrained. And I will be the first to say, by and large, people do not ask to have them. Just like you did not ask to have a sin tendency. We were born in sin. Mm -hmm. We didn't use that. One manifestation of the sin nature is homosexual desire. Now, that That manifestation is only experienced by a minority. Most people would not know what it's like to have that particular temptation. Um, There are some temptations that are common to all of us, right? Like the temptation to punch somebody out or to lust or to lie. Mm -hmm. We all know what those are like. Then others, you know, they're experienced by a minority of people. If you, golly, if you read the book of Deuteronomy, you look at some behaviors in there and you think, you got to be kidding me. Some would anybody even want to do that? Yeah, somebody would. Maybe not you, maybe not me, but some do. Same thing with this. So there is such a thing as homosexual desire, but orientation is a broad term that is meant to legitimize, and that's one of the reasons I try to avoid using it. Yeah, Joe Dallas is my guest. 
You can learn more about Joe and his uh, body of work at joedallas.com. You know, Joe, I, you hear the expression, I was born this way, but there's no genetic causation for any of this. So this just sounds like it's made up. Well, I think the idea, you know, of of uh, convincing people that homosexuality is normal will have to do with two things, um, inborn and immutable. Okay. If you can convince people it's inborn and immutable, then you'll convince people that it's sort of like the race you were born with. Well, the race you are born into is a gift. It's a predetermined choice by God, just like the sex you were born was a gift, a predetermined choice by God. If people can get homosexuality to be classified that way, then, of course, uh, people will will feel like, well, if I object to homosexuality, that's like being a racist. Well, nobody wants to be that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that linguistically, all of this is very clever because it's one of the ways you convince a culture to normalize what God never intended in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Joe, is the church doing... uh a good job at addressing uh, sexuality issues, or do they prefer it not be addressed in church? Ah, uh, it depends on the church. Okay. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know how that goes, Bill. Yeah. Anytime we talk about the church, you got to think, well, I mean, some churches are doing a great job. Okay. Some not so good, some terrible. But by and large, if we want to generalize, I think that, that the church at large has not addressed this as clearly and as... Um, uh, as seriously as we should. Mm-hmm. And as a result, we dropped the ball in a lot of ways. I really felt we dropped the ball during the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and the early 90s. I think we dropped the ball as the gay rights movement was picking up stream. Either we talked about this just in a condemning way, just to say God says homosexuality is a sin there, mm-hmm. without talking about what to do if it has impacted your own life. Yeah. Kind of like talking about abortion, okay? I mean, I I thank God that so much of the church has clearly taken a strong pro-life position. I think we could be stronger about it, but whatever. I'm I'm glad we hold that position. But we also realized decades ago, it's not enough just to tell uh, unwed mothers or mothers in crisis pregnancy, don't abort your child. We also needed to learn to walk with the mother to help her do the right thing. Mm Mm-hmm. On this issue, it's not enough to say to homosexual people, don't commit that sin, it's bad, without also saying, hey, in our church, if you want to be free from that, we will walk with you in discipleship. We will mentor you. If you have a son or a daughter who has come out as gay or lesbian, we will be there to to comfort you and to strengthen you and to offer you help. If you are a young person confused about your gender identity, Mm -hmm. you're not sure if you're a boy or a girl, we'll be there for you. In other words, We've got to be about solutions, not just prohibitions. Prohibitions are important, so let's not apologize for those. No. But let's also talk about solutions. Uh, You see? Yeah, I do. I do. Thank you for that, Joe Dallas. If you have a question or comment for Joe, please let me know what you'd like uh, me to ask him. You can text your question over to 877-933-2484. Joe, is it ever appropriate for a believer to adopt the label of gay Christian? No. No. No, it is not. I I feel strongly about this. Um, I hope I'm not turning into one of those jerks who's forever <laughs> nitpicking at people because uh-huh. we got enough of those, don't we, Bill? I oh, mean, you yeah. on social media. Oh my yeah. gosh, yeah. there are some people who are just so darn doctrinally pure that nothing, nobody can pass their standards. You know, <laughs> um, there are areas we can agree to disagree on. Okay. Yeah. Um, the rapture of the church. Now, come on, somebody's right about that. Of course. (laughs) I know where I stand. I have no problem, you know, with that, but I would never call that a hill to die on. But when it comes to the very way we identify ourselves, Bill, I, I repented of homosexuality back in 1984. One of the first things that was made very clear to me, both, both by what I read in scripture and what I really felt, the Spirit of God was saying was, I was never again to refer to myself as gay. I, well, I, I It was also very clear to me, I should be honest, if I had same-sex temptations, I needed to confess those and not pretend that they're not there. But to have those temptations is not the same as identifying by those temptations. You see? Mm-hmm. The term gay is a positive term. We should never put a positive term on feelings God never intended. 
That's like putting a positive term on lust. You don't do that. Yeah. It also is a way of identifying with sin, not with our place as believers, Christians, sons and daughters of God. You see, so for those reasons, I I believe that when people identify themselves as gay Christians, there are generally two reasons they do it. One would be if they were like me. I was on staff with a pro-gay church. I called myself a gay Christian, uh, as in I'm very proud of being gay. God made me this way. The Bible does not condemn it, and I'm in a gay relationship. That's one kind of gay Christian. Another kind, it's this is something we've just seen in the last few years, is somebody who says, well, I'm a Christian and I know homosexuality is a sin, but I have homosexual desires or temptations. Therefore, I'm a gay Christian. And my argument would be, we ought never to identify ourselves by a sinful tendency. That is a way of minimizing the seriousness of the sin and in too many cases that I've seen firsthand, when people adopt that kind of label, it becomes much easier to eventually legitimize homosexual feelings when you have identified them as a primary part of yourself. So for all those reasons, besides which, come on, do we really need another label? No. <laughs> We've already got so many of those going on. Yeah. I don't want to put a label on myself that would separate me from the rest of the body. Um Unless it is a legitimate label. I happen to be half bald. I own that. I'm not in denial. <laughs> but I really did not come on your show saying, hi, I'm bald Joe. Joe, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, there's more to me than my bald spot. Okay. <laughs> so for all of those reasons, my, that's a long-winded <laughs> answer to you, Bill. No, it's a great answer. No, I do not believe that that is ever an appropriate term. Yeah. I really do. But you will have, certainly people have told you this over the decades, Joe, that I, you know, if they will come out and tell you that they're a gay Christian and then, and then what are you going to say to them? Well, yeah, of so. course, it would depend on the context of the conversation. Sure. I mean, I'm not out to correct everybody I run into. If somebody says to me, I am a gay Christian, I would probably say, well, can you clarify for me, do you believe that homosexuality is right in God's sight or wrong in God's sight? Uh, that's a good starting point. That's because a great starting say, point. Yeah. Now, if they say that's right, they say, I believe it's right. Well, then I'm then our our argument is going to be over whether or not homosexuality is legitimate not over whether it's a legitimate label. Mm. And, and, and so I want to say, let's look at what the scriptures has to say about homosexuality. If they say, I believe it's wrong, then I'd say, let's talk about whether or not it's legitimate to label ourselves by a sinful tendency. Interesting. And Joe, yeah. you also are aware that, because you wrote a book on it, how there's a lot of pro-gay advocates that are misreading the gospel and, and teaching, and there's a lot of people gravitating towards that teaching. Well, what do you think just happened last week? The United Methodist Church, finally, the shoe dropped. I think I think most of us saw it coming, but they have now officially adopted a pro-gay position. Okay. And they are joining the Presbyterian Church USA in that era, and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, and the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Bill, we talk a lot about the falling away the apostasia, or what we call apostasy, which is very real. And we are seeing it around us. A falling away, it doesn't mean that non-Christians are falling away. They're already fallen. They're already dead in sin. And we're talking about believers falling away from the faith, falling away from orthodoxy and sound doctrine. Um, it's always sad to see. But before there's a falling away, there's a moving towards and the United Methodist Church is a good example. They started discussing this years ago. When you start discussing something that is already so scripturally self-evident, you've already got a serious problem. Good point. I mean, like in your church, Bill, if, if your pastor announced, okay, next week we're going to have a special town hall meeting discussion on whether or not Jesus is the only way to God. Yeah. I'm not so sure you'd want to stay in that church. I'd be gone that week, yeah. Why are you even discussing something that is so self-evident, you yeah, see? Yeah, great point. So, you know, this is where all these denominations, and I, I've worked with some of them when they were in the middle of these discussions, the Presbyterian Church USA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the Episcopal Church, 
they did not start by just saying, okay, we're going to go pro-gay. They started with, and I, I don't know how else to frame it, so let's just be blunt. They started with the question the serpent asked, hath God said? Did God really say what he said, or perhaps did he mean something else? Mm-hmm. And that way, you know, and that's where it always starts, these discussion committees. Yeah. <laughs> I like, you, you know, let's yeah. let's revisit what we already said we believe. Right. And then you start if you start discussing it, by even discussing it, you're saying it is up for negotiating. Yeah. We're gonna make a change if we're discussing it. Right, because That's just true. like you said, you'd be out, you'd be out the door in a New York minute if yes, your church. Yes, I would, Joe Dallas. Whether or not yeah. Jesus, yeah, so would yeah. I. So would I, and I wouldn't care how wonderful the church had been up to that point. But it wouldn't have been wonderful if it got to that point. I mean, yeah. that's 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 exactly what I'm saying here. So, when in each case they started with these discussions, roundtable committee meetings. Um, and what the churches, the, the the big disappointment I had in all of these denominations is the people who started these discussions were not in the majority, but the majority within the church would not do anything about it. They would allow these groups to grow within the denomination and thrive within the denomination. Now, think for a minute about this, Bill. When Paul wrote to Corinth, he was mad. <laughs> he was angry about a lot of things. But one thing he was especially indignant about was the fact that a man was practicing immorality in the church, and the church wouldn't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And see, I think this is the problem. When you, as a church, as a bot, whether the denomination or the fellowship or the local congregation, when you are willing to allow people to either practice immorality openly or challenge the biblical standards of morality openly, mm-hmm. you're guilty of allowing that leaven to get a hold of the church. Yeah. So don't be surprised when it spreads. That's what leaven does. Is it never stays localized, yeah. you know? Good point. Take a little break. So I think that's what happened. Oh, sorry, Joe. I didn't mean to step on your last uh, few words there, but we're going to take a short break and be back with Joe Dallas. He is, directs a biblical counseling ministry for those dealing with sexual and relational problems. He's authored many books, and you can check him out at joedallas.com. If you have a question for Joe, send it over. I already see some coming up on the text line. That number is 877-933-2484. This is Suzy Larson, host of Suzy Larson Live. Maybe you have a loved one that you've been praying for for years, and they still haven't trusted Jesus. Or maybe you have a loved one who once had a vibrant faith, but has since walked away. If this is true for you, know this, you're not alone. God sees you, he loves you, and he knows about the heartache you feel. And we care about it too. I've recorded 15 audio clips to encourage your soul. Text the word HEART to 877-933-2484. So glad to have Joe Dallas on the program. JoeDallas.com, check it out. He's authored six books on human sexuality from the Christian perspective. And Joe, there's a, a lot of questions everybody has. You know, when, when we have you on, the text line kind of lights up and and people always are cur- curious to know how we best uh, handle and approach situations where we don't know quite what to do. Here's uh, a listener that says, I just found out that my next door neighbor who bought a house together are lesbians. And I, I guess I already knew that, but one of them came out of the house just the other day and said, look, she's pregnant. She she said we're going to have our first child. So how do I handle that? I think uh, you know Paul said walk in wisdom towards those who are on the outside. That would include walking in friendliness, affection, respect, being a good neighbor. Mm-hmm. And the fact that this is a lesbian couple does not prevent you from doing any of that. You cannot, with integrity, say I think it's wonderful that you are a lesbian couple. But that child that is being born, that is uh, a precious child, you can be there to, in in any way, help with, uh, you know, in in any practical way. But uh, I think that walking in wisdom includes a prayerful sense of timing. You know, Paul told Timothy, the servant of the Lord must be, among other things, apt to teach. You don't want to go barging in there saying, hey, didn't you ladies read Leviticus? I mean, that would be stupid. Mm-hmm. But you do want to be looking for opportunity first to share the gospel, because, hey, that's the issue. The The lesbianism is secondary to the fact that they need Jesus. They mm-hmm. need to be born again. 
Um, but you want to be looking for opportunities to, to share truth. And there's not a, a rule book on when to speak and exactly what to say. What you do want to be looking for is the opportunity and praying for wisdom, which James promised God will give you if you ask him for it. And uh, meanwhile, while you may not know exactly when or what to say, you have to wait on that leading from God, the right timing, the right circumstance, and so forth. Um, be there. Be be friendly. Be open. Be engaged. By the way, you're you're hitting on something very personal for me there, uh, Bill, or I should say the the um, the person who texted that is because when my wife and I moved into our new home. It's not new anymore. This is 30 years ago, but we, <laughs> we learned that our, our neighbors were a lesbian couple. Uh -huh. Well, my ministry was already in full gear by then, and so it wasn't long before they found out what I do, and we, we got to know each other. But you know what? I, To be honest, I could not have asked for nicer neighbors. Uh, they were terrific women. I, I liked them, loved them, and respected them. We did not agree. We had very brief, rather general talks about faith and sexuality, and they were just in a completely different galaxy than me. That didn't keep us from from being friendly to them. And even a couple of times I cat sat for them, you know, mm -hmm. when, when our second son was born, they were there with a gift. And, and so you can have good relationships, look for the opportunity, but serve and love as you can. And I think that's the best approach to be taken. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that answer, Joe Dallas. All right, how do you come to terms and move forward with accepting the life of solitude when you deny your same-sex attraction? Well, I do not believe that the two necessarily go together. If you deny a life of same-sex attraction, if you basically say, I am not going to yield any longer to these desires, uh, I know my first assumption was that I would be forever celibate, but celibate and solitude, those are two different things. I think that your life should be full of love, the love of other members of the body of Christ, of hopefully your family, close friendships that you develop. That, that alone means it's not a life of solitude. It may be that you choose not to marry because you do not meet someone to whom you are sexually um, uh, attracted. Mm -hmm. That happens. That is no fault of your own. That is simply that that uh, it, it has not pleased God to bring someone into your life to whom you could respond in that way. And I was fully accepting of the fact that that might be my story, too. Mm -hmm. It did not turn out to be my story. I met my wife in 1984, about a year after I repented, and I married her three years later. We've been married 37 years now. Oh, wow. However, that's not everybody's story. True. And I know very godly Christ-centered men and women who repented of homosexual sin, but did not ever find themselves attracted to someone of the opposite sex. And so they chose a celibate life. They're not lonely. Do, do they ever feel sexual frustration? Of course they do. But let's be honest. I think we all, I think we can all be mature enough and honest enough to admit being married does not solve all sexual frustration either. I mean, it's it's not like you enter the promised land once you get married. <laughs> so I, I mean, seriously. So I, I think that uh, you you handle sexual temptation, sexual longings the way that you would any other longings outside of God's will. Now, I think that you do, especially as a, if you are indeed called to lifelong celibacy, make sure that you are investing very well in your primary relationships, close family members, close friends, be very engaged with the church. And uh, I think that what you will find is that you're in the same position married people are in, in that um, we all find our lives lacking the degree of fulfillment we would like them to have, all of us, emotionally, sexually, relationally, in every way, all of us have to uh, be mature enough to accept some of the frustration of not getting all that we want while still moving ahead and by the grace of God, making sure we get what we need. So I I think that's the best way to approach that whole issue of uh, celibacy. Mm, thank you for that, Joe. Here's a question. If I say something is a sin, am I guilty of judging? If you say something is a sin, you are judging. That does not make you guilty. Guilty implies you've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, Bill, the way people throw out the uh, judge not scripture. Oh, yeah. 
as as if Jesus was telling us never believe anything is right or wrong. Now that's absurd, because you, you know uh, the same Jesus who said judge not said, don't don't try to take the speck out of your brother's eye unless you first remove the log in your own, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Hey, that takes judgment. Jesus also said, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. That means you have to judge whether or not he sinned against you. So clearly, Jesus was not saying, have no standard of right or wrong. What he did say, and I think his teaching bears this out, is that you cannot ever say that you are better than another person. You cannot judge another person's worth, and you cannot judge another person's motivation. You can't read somebody's mind. You know, if you do something that I don't like, I don't have the right to say, I know why you did that. You know, I don't know that. All I know is what you said or did may be wrong. And uh, by the way, anybody who preaches the word, gives the full counsel of God, or in any way teaches scripture has to judge because you make a judgment based on the word of God. In fact, Paul very specifically said, all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for reproof rebuke, correction. That's judging, you see? Mm, yeah. So, um, I, you know, like I said, if you say something is a sin, you have judged properly. You have to do that. Mm -hmm. If you say or think or even imply that you are better than someone because they committed a sin, now you're judging wrongfully. If you think you can read somebody else's mind, you are judging wrongfully. That's very presumptive. Only God can do that. But if you simply recognize based on the word of God that something is sinful and you point it out, you did what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, is it, isn't it wrong to tell people in the homosexual lifestyle that they have to stay celibate in order to be pleasing to God? Well, it's not about staying celibate or getting married that makes you pleasing to God. It's living a life of obedience. Amen. When you, if you are involved in a sexual sin of any kind, the first and foremost thing, if you let me backtrack a little here, Bill. We're really talking about two groups. If you are a homosexual person who is a non Christian, then I'm not going to be talking about to you about what to do with your sexuality in order to please God. I'm going to be talking to, to you about the need to be born again. Amen. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Jesus yeah. is talking to a Samaritan woman. Okay, she's right. in sexual sin, right? right. He knew it. Yeah, he didn't affirm it. No. But that he didn't even want to talk about it. He he said, "Yes, I recognize it," and of course, he knew he was not in any way implying that it was okay. But the main thing was he wanted her to live. He wanted her to drink everlasting living water and to know the Messiah she was talking to. Right. That's the point. But if someone is claiming to be a Christian or is a Christian, then um, the question is not, "Am I telling you to be celibate in order?" And that's what's going to you know make you pleasing to God. What's going to make you pleasing to God is living obediently. If God is leading you, you're being led by Him, which is what a disciple does. Okay, so you basically say, "Lord, I belong to you." What I know to be sin, I will not do. I may be tempted every day towards it, but the answer is no, I will not give in to it. Now you lead me. If you are leading me into marriage, so be it, I will marry. If you are leading me into celibacy, so be it, I will be celibate. But what makes us pleasing to God isn't whether we are married or celibate. It's whether we are obedient. That's the point. Right, right. Joe Dallas is my guest. If you have a question for Joe or let us know what it is, 877-933-933. 2484. We'll take a short break and be right back. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. Yeah. What's for dinner? Hey. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. Welcome to the show. If you just climbed in your car, I'm talking to Joe Dallas today. He is a conference speaker and an ordained pastoral counselor. He directs a biblical counseling ministry for those dealing with sexual and relational problems. He's authored a number of books. His most recent one is called Christians in a Cancel Culture. I've had the pleasure of talking to him about that book. But today I'm asking him uh, some questions about uh, our culture and the way in which 
we talk and engage with people that we may have disagreements with or confusion about. And Joe, we have always lots of people asking questions. And I know you've probably heard a lot of these kinds of questions before, because I don't know if we're ever getting an answer that we're satisfied with. So um, if I were to ask you, I've been invited to a a same-sex wedding. Should I go? No, I I don't believe you should. And I know I said that very simplistically. Let me um, clarify, Bill. There are a number of Christian leaders who would say that there are times when you should go. And um, a lot of them are people I respect very much, but I disagree with them. And the reason I disagree is going to a wedding is not the same as going to a party. If a gay friend of mine was having a birthday party, I'd go. Mm -hmm. I'd bring a person. Fine. But to go to a wedding is to physically make a statement of affirmation. You are there as a witness to a ceremony. And if you are not there as a witness agreeing with that ceremony, in my opinion, you have no business being there. So this is not just about a same-sex wedding. This is about any wedding ceremony that involves uniting a couple who I do not believe should be united. So if a Christian friend of mine married a non-Christian, I could not go. That would be a violation of what Paul said about being unequally yoked. If a Christian friend of mine dumped his wife for a young woman and then turned around and married the young woman, I couldn't go. Mm -hmm. And the same would be true of a same-sex wedding. I could not say that I... By my, that I bless and affirm what is being done. And if I can't say that, I do not think I belong there. Paul told the Ephesians, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Paul told Timothy, do not be a participant in another person's sins. Well, I think that would be a direct violation of both of those verses um, to, to attend a same-sex wedding. So, by the way, this is a very emotional issue, Bill. I I hope I'm not being flippant. I hope I don't sound flippant. You don't. I know that if your son or daughter came to you and said, Mom, Dad, I love this person. I want to marry this person, and I want you there. That would be gut-wrenching, because, because to say I won't come on what may be to you the most important day of your life, it's a pretty heavy thing to say. But I think it's a crucial thing to say. Because uh, I think that you would be in direct violation of God by attending something, dressing up and showing up there. I believe you would be saying before God, I think this person knows better than you what a marriage is. I would not want to say that to God. So what, what I encourage people to say is, I'm sorry, I can't do that. But look, I would never ask you to do anything which would violate your own conscience. Please don't ask me to do something which would violate mine. I hope you understand. Mm -hmm. Fair and reasonable and biblical. Thank you for that. All right, uh, Joe Dallas, here's a question. My brother and his partner claim the Bible only says don't look at porn or be a pedophile, but homosexuality isn't condemned. Even in Lot's case, my brother claimed it was about hospitality, not sex. Well, I I think that's a misreading of uh, all of the scriptures that the the person has just referred to. I, I think what your brother is doing is what I used to do, trying to basically adopt a revision of the Bible to justify uh, homosexuality. Let's be clear. Uh, I don't believe that Sodom was destroyed just because of homosexuality, but homosexuality played a large part in its destruction. Uh, Any city wicked enough where the men not only would attempt a homosexual act, but would actually gather in mass to attempt a homosexual rape, Mm -hmm. there's a lot going on in that city besides homosexuality. I mean, we're talking violent depravity there. But homosexuality absolutely played a part of it. Just to be honest, Bill, if God judged San Francisco right now, um, I think homosexuality would have a lot to do with it. But it wouldn't be the only thing, you know. And uh, so, in fact, God said through uh, Ezekiel that homosexuality was, or excuse me, that Sodom was destroyed because of abominations, yes, and because of perversions, and because of indifference to the poor, and because of idolatry. All of them were a part of that. 
but homosexuality had a lot to do with it. Now, as for saying the Bible only says don't look at porn or don't practice pedophilia, but homosexuality is legit, homosexuality is specifically named and forbidden in Leviticus chapter 18, in Leviticus 20, Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, and 1 Timothy 1, 10. All of them use wording in the original Hebrew and Greek, which specifies adult men with adult men. It's got nothing to do with pedophilia or rape. It has everything to do with two consenting adult males engaging in something God considers abominable. And there's really no way to to get around that with any intellectual integrity. Mm -hmm. Joe, here's a question. If your husband or wife has had a sexual sin in your relationship— how can you know if that person has ever changed, if they've repented? How do you know they've really changed? Well, the best thing to observe is the fruit. <clears throat> when John the Baptist was uh, baptizing, he said, bring forth fruit that is worthy of repentance. So if someone says, I'm repentant, I say, show me the money. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Have you stopped the behavior? Can that be verified that you've stopped it? And... Have you taken steps both to, if you can, correct the damage done by the behavior and steps to prevent yourself from turning back to that behavior? So the three things you look for, cessation of the behavior, it's over, it's done, and uh, addressing whatever damage it's done that you can address. You know, I felt on the one hand helpless when I repented. There was There were some things that I just couldn't undo. What I could address, I did. And then the third is, have you taken steps to prevent it from happening again? And this is especially true if you are married to someone or considering marrying someone who says homosexuality was part of my past. Well, I, I had to give my wife that speech. I gave it to her on uh, our second date, which, you know, you better believe that didn't set a very romantic mood for the evening, but she needed to know. And uh, she had the right to to ask me, well, is it really behind you? And does your life point to the fact it's behind you? And, uh, you, you know, what, if anything, are you doing to make sure it's behind you? That That's fair and reasonable to ask. So I think if you stick with that, um, of course, you know and I know that you there's, there's not a guarantee if, if somebody says something's in the past and they're good at hiding and lying. Could it be that they will betray you in the future? That is a possibility. That's a risk we all take when we marry. But the more you know the person and know about their relationship with Christ, look for godliness in general, and you will probably find godliness in the specific, okay? Mm -hmm. So the person you're thinking of marrying, are they generally Christ-centered? Are they in the Word? Do, have you found them to be honest? Have you found them to be truthful about their areas of weakness? Do you find them to be humble? Do you find them to be sincere? You're probably on solid ground. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that answer. Joe Dallas is my guest. You can learn more about Joe at his website, joedallas.com. And if you have a question, let me know what it is, 877 2484 Again, 877 Three three two four eight four. We'll take a little break and we'll be right back. If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. Welcome back to the show. Joe Dallas is my guest. We're talking about sexuality today. And I appreciate, Joe, your... your um, your depth that you take us to in the the bi solid biblical foundation on which you speak it it means a lot to all of the listeners as I'm hearing on the text line people appreciate you so I thank you as well. Um, oh, I appreciate that, Bill. Yeah, uh, because we are uh, the the culture right now is something that is so, it's so hard to uh, because what we call good is evil, evil is good. We're so upside down on everything and especially young kids today, they're really forced to go along with the crowd and oh my gosh, not, yeah. not appear judgmental or or be accepting of everything, and otherwise you're just canceled instantly. Yeah, and, and you know what's true of, I think, a lot of us, even those of us who are not kids, Bill, 
Uh, we know where we stand, but there are a lot of questions about how to stand. How do we take our stand? When do we speak? When do we not? What do we say? So for most, well, I think probably most Christian adults, we pretty much know what the truth is. The question is, how do I speak it? For our young people, I mean, more than ever, we really do need to help them understand what is truth. So that's a challenge today. Yeah. Uh, and are they in a position where they're willing to have honest dialogue with uh, biblical teachers and, and people that can walk them through some of these very tough questions? Yeah, that's a good question, because, you know, this is really exactly what Paul told Timothy it was going to be, that there would come a time when sound doctrine wouldn't even be tolerated. Yeah, right. And you know what? Uh, we're living it. We're living it. Yeah. So uh, as you as you speak, uh, and you're at conferences, and, and you're writing books and everything, and I, I think I've asked you a lot of common questions— what has been surfacing among the people in your at your conferences? What what question is coming up more than than the others? Well, uh, a lot of people, Bill, are asking about church life because we're facing situations we haven't faced before. Uh, you remember when um, uh, in, in the Book of Acts, when Gentiles started coming into the kingdom, why there was a real controversy. The whole Jerusalem Council had to be held to determine what do we do with Gentiles who come to church, you know? And uh, I, I think that's where we are on this issue, because more and more people are coming to church who are openly gay, openly lesbian, openly transgender. That's one group. Another group is parents who have loved ones who've come out to them. And another group is people within the church who are repentant. So I'm hearing more and more questions about should we baptize someone who is in a gay relationship but says they are a believer? And, of course, I believe the answer is no. Baptism is about taking up your cross and denying yourself, not just about saying you believe in Jesus. Um, should someone be in leadership if they are attracted to the same sex but they are not acting on it? Mm -hmm. I would say, well, yes, provided that they are living godly lives. If somebody has a temptation and they're in leadership, well, tell me anybody in leadership who doesn't have a temptation, and I'll say you've got a leader who uh, died some years ago. <laughs> I mean, every, yeah. we all have temptations of some kind. The right. question is, how is he dealing with that? Um, or the question of what do we do with, say, there's a, a person who has repented. They were tr living a transgender life. They even had some degree of cosmetic work done, and now they've come to the church and repented. So this man, a uh, biological male, now has had breast implants and looks exactly like a woman and goes by a female name and says, I've come to the Lord. I want to live a godly life. What do I do now? Should we have this person live continually as a woman? Should we say, no, you're not a woman. You need to live as a man. What do we do? And my response is that person has always been a man and will always be a man and uh, has done some damage to himself physically in some of what he's done. But we should encourage him to embrace his male identity and to, in every possible way, live that out. Now, that does not mean that he is called to become John Wayne, mm -hmm. because not every man is intended to be a stereotypically masculine man, but he is a man and needs to uh, uh, adopt the name, the pronoun, and the dress of a man and allow God to work in him in what areas need work. And I think we should celebrate that with that person and walk with him, but I certainly don't think we should confirm him in an error or align ourselves with that error. You mm -hmm. see what I mean? I do, yeah. So these are practical questions that are coming up in churches. And these are, like I said, things that we, you know, golly, in, in, in some uh, churches, you know, there's a, you find that there's a, a, a young people's retreat held at a camp out, and that's really wonderful. And somebody who has been attending is transgender. And in some cases, it was not even known that that was a biological male who has been presenting as a female. And then it's found out, and that person wants to sleep in the girl's dormitory. Yeah, right. <laughs> now the church has to say, you yeah. know, we, we, we've got to ask you to sleep in the men's dormitory or possibly if they want to accommodate the person to sleep on his own. But what they can't do is align with the error that that person has adopted. Mm -hmm. 
but these are tough you know these are policy issues that are 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 you know emotional and and they can i think the answers are not all that complex but it is difficult to abide by these clear answers because these days those those answers are so controversial mm -hmm. but joe, they're true nonetheless yeah so joe i want to just return we've got a few minutes left i want to talk again about the idea that you've got a loved one uh, a son, a daughter, a, a granddaughter, a grandson, a nephew, a niece, and they're, they want to move into a, a, a biblical, um, they want to move into an unbiblical relationship. I can't even call it marriage because marriage is between a man and a woman, right? So right. Uh, you want to stand your biblical position, but you also know you're standing at the tip of the relational cliff where this could be it forever. Uh, how do you play that game? Uh and it's not a game. I'm not saying it's a game. No, no, I know it's bad, a bad expression on my part, but I'm saying. No, but what, what strategy do you yeah, use? Yeah, that's the, exactly. That's, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Tough yeah. one. That is, it's incredibly tough. Um, I think what you want to do is appeal to the reason of that person. Will you please be reasonable with me? Mm -hmm. So let me play out the role of the father. My daughter has come to me and said, I want to marry this woman I love very much. I want she will be a part of my life. I want you to be there. I want you to see us as a couple. If we come over and stay for Christmas, we sleep in the same room, the same bed together. I want you to treat my partner the way you would treat uh, a man if I had married a man. And I am insisting on that if you want a relationship with me. I would want I would say something like, honey, please be reasonable with me. You knew that I was a Bible-believing Christian before you ever decided to embrace this aspect of your life. Is it reasonable to expect me to change just because you changed? I love you. I will always love you. And I will do my best to meet you halfway when meeting you halfway will not be a violation of my conscience. But I wouldn't ask you to violate yours. Don't ask me to violate mine. I will have a relationship with you. We will do our best to keep our home open to you and as as we are all able to, to enjoy even the company of you and your partner. But no, I could not host you sleeping together in my home because as you already know, I consider what you're doing to be a sexual sin that I cannot host. I cannot attend something that is called a wedding uh, if I don't believe in it, nor can I refer to this as a wedding. But I will not impose on you all of these truths. I believe you already know them. I'm not going to remind you of them every time I see you, but nor will I allow you to impose your redefinitions on me. Now, I believe we can have a relationship with each other, even if neither one of us is getting what we want. You're not getting me to change the way I approach this. And so you're, you're disappointed. I cannot force you to abide by what I know to be biblically true. So in that case, I'm disappointed. Are we mature enough and reasonable enough, and do we love each other enough to continue our bond despite these disappointments and difficulties? And I think that's a very fair and a very adult and a biblical way of approaching it. But here's the deal. Like I said before, Bill, this, this really is a hill with a sign on it that says, die here, you know? If it will cost you the relationship, I hope it won't, but if it does, um, let it only be because the other person was demanding of you something that you cannot in good conscience give. Mm -hmm. Because if, when the back's against the wall, we got to say what Peter and, and John said, we, we ought to obey God rather than man. You know, don't try to push me to say things I don't believe or do things I don't believe in. If you really are trying to do that, who's rejecting who here? Hint, hint, it's not me rejecting you, you know? Mm -hmm. So well said, Joe. Thank you. Uh, that that was a an amazing, amazing final monologue. <laughs> <laughs> that is um, so appreciative. And I know we have a lot of listeners are very grateful for your wisdom and insight. And thank you once again for coming on the show. Bill, it is always a pleasure. I'm I'm honored whenever you ask me. By the way, hello, Billings. Glad you're joining. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> thank you. Hey, listen, anytime. It's always a pleasure talking with Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Joe Dallas has been my guest. You can learn more about Joe at his website. That's joedallas.com. Well, guess what? Next hour, Jeff Verdorn, my friend and Bible teacher, is sitting in the green room. I can see him from here. And he's going to come in and we're going to start our study on 
the book of Timothy. I can hardly wait. Be right back. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.